thank you again for this day, Lord. I just want to thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you for keeping us safe, Lord. I actually continue to be with um, all the activities and things we have coming up. Lord, thank you for a wonderful service we have this morning. Thank you for the word of God during this morning as we come to our prayer list that we have this evening, Lord. I will ask you to be with uh, Beverly King, Nancy Newton, Audrey Hoskins, Jack Dale, Jamie Cole, Angie Moore, Brenda Bryan family, Earl and Barbara Clarkson, Polly Fry, Scott Dean, who has uh, upcoming back surgery, Earl and uh, Deborah Connor, who has a, uh, a bad cold. I actually continue to be with Linda Durham, Judy Snow, who also has um, back surgery coming up, Amy Grafton, Cindy Rutherford, Maureen Johnson, Joyce Myers and family for the loss of uh, his brother, Angie Oaks, Bonnie Rains, Liz Thompson, Evelyn Watlington, Connie Wiles, Irene Bell, Gary McCollum, Vicki and Robert Reed, Mike Tickle, who's sick at home, Eston Lewis, who's also sick at home, Stephen Sheila Richardson, who uh, has a doctor's appointment tomorrow, Jessica Bissell, who's uh, sick in the hospital, and for the families of the fire in New York. I just want to thank you again for this opportunity to come and uh, lift up prayers and you, Lord, knowing good and well that you'll answer them according to your will, Lord. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen.
62 is the standard scene to God be the glory. She's going to sit down for I told her to. But anyway, that's all right. Y'all happy to be in church? I'm happy to be anywhere dry. We definitely got a church full of Baptists tonight. Everybody's in the back. Back row Baptists, full-blooded. Ushers come, let's take our offering tonight. Let's be faithful in giving back to God as he's blessed us. God loves a cheerful giver. Say amen. You look at Greek word up. In the Greek New Testament, it means hilarious. So, ha, 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 let me give you some offering. See, so he's not even paying attention. Thank you. <laughs> let's give tonight, let's be faithful in our giving. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to be in your house tonight, to hear your words sang and preached and, be, and hear prayers lifted up. We pray that you'd hear and answer our prayers, help all of our sick, and we'll reach down, touch them, heal them, have them back quickly. And we ask you to do that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
just a hand. Appreciate Angie. Take your Bibles and turn to Ezekiel 22, verse 20. Put your finger there, and then go to Deuteronomy chapter 9, okay? Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, and then go to Deuteronomy 9, 26. Aren't you glad Diane has got rid of her frog? Y'all can do better than that. Aren't you glad God, Diane got rid of the frog? Amen. All right, Diane's going to sing before the message. <laughs> and 
and his word and the love of, the, uh, of, of one man for his nation. That was Moses. So here's God who's righteous, God who's given us his word and he keeps his word. But now there stood a man begging him to help Israel with their stubbornness. I can't understand where Moses is coming from. As a pastor, one of the most heartbreaking things I deal with is people who will not listen, who will not learn, and they cannot live because of it. We have to listen to the Word of God. God has always been looking for a man or a woman to stand in the gap to bring him and man together. And that's our job now, to get so close to God that we're his ambassadors in this world to bring God and man to, together in salvation. Ezekiel 22, 30 says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land. If there was ever a time, Danville, Virginia, forget the rest of the country, rest of the state, if there was ever a time Danville, Virginia needs a church to stand in the gap, it's today. A church that will stand for the truth and love and kindness, but stand as a bright light in the midst of a dark world. Danville is getting darker and darker and darker. Evil is, is a looming over our town, and more is coming. And if we don't start shining this light as bright as we can, it's going to take over. I don't know about you, I don't like the dark. I like the light. I don't like to live in darkness. Then he says, Therefore I poured out mine indignation upon them. Now let me back up. That I should not destroy it. But I found what? That's the heartbreaking part. That's why I'm tickled to see y'all tonight. I know y'all love God and you love the Word of God to bed on a rainy night with all this COVID flying around and all these colds and stomach viruses rolling around and some of you got your plates plumb filled, but you know what? You're in church tonight. Say amen. Thank God you're here for a reason. And you, you could possibly, no, I mean, you could be that man or woman standing in the gap for God where you live, where you work, in your family. He said, therefore I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. God's a righteous God, and God has to keep his word. And if we don't repent, there's going to be trouble. It's our job to be convicted, confess, repent, and return to God. Now, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 9 now. Let's talk about Moses for just a few minutes. Moses had a request for forgiveness. In Deuteronomy 9, 26, I, this is Moses, prayed therefore unto the Lord. He didn't call a committee meeting of those Israelites. Isn't that amazing? He didn't find a few of his friends and cry over the way Israel was acting. He didn't do that. He went straight to the one who could do something about it. He went to God. He went to the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not, two words, thy people. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful tonight I'm one of his. I'm thankful I'm saved. I may not always act like it. You may not always act like it because we're human beings. But I'll tell you one thing. I thank God that I'm on my way to heaven. And I'm washed in the blood. And I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. And I'm heaven bound with a hammer down whenever he's ready. But let me tell you something. He said, and not only his people, but have you ever thought of the fact that you're God's inheritance? When you think of an inheritance, you think of something left over when somebody dies. Well, Jesus has already died. But thank God he rose from the grave. And there's coming a day when he's going to come back and take over this old world. And he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And then we're going to live in eternity with him forever. And we are his inheritance. We are what he's looking forward to. I went to the mailbox today. And there was this nice little envelope that said American Capital. Does anybody know what American capital is? Y'all in trouble. You should know what it is. That's my retirement. You ought to have a retirement. Some of you young people, you better start now because you're going to get old before you turn your head around good. But I got that American capital. And it 
tells me how much uh, uh, retirement I got. And I never thought I'd ever retire. I won't ever quit preaching, but I will retire from pastoring one day. I promise you that. But I never thought I'd get to do it. But you know what? Them numbers are starting to look pretty good unless some stupid president messes it up. Or some dumb governor messes it up. It's looking pretty good. It looks like I might get to spend a few years running the roads and enjoying myself while I leave this old earth. And that's what I've worked all my life for, is to enjoy retirement. God has sent his son and worked all these years trying to reach people with the gospel so he would have an inheritance one day. And you and I are that inheritance. You and I are what he's looking forward to. Which thou hast redeemed through thy what? Let me tell you something. God, what God did for me and you is nothing less than great. Great. Nothing less than great. Which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Now Moses was a wise man. When trouble came on the scene that he could not handle, He'd done the smart thing. He called on the Lord. Moses didn't beat around the bush. He came right out with what was on his heart. You know what? That's what this altar's for. Try it. You might like it. Just come out here and tell God what's on your heart. You'd be surprised what a good meal and a good cry and a good release it'll do for you when you get up from that altar knowing that you've talked to somebody who can do something for you. He can do anything you ask if you pray and believe. Say Amen. He'll, he'll, he'll meet that need. Moses does something that all of us ought to do. He reminds the Lord of his promises. You say, God forgets. No, that's not what it is. You know, God needs to know that you're reading his book. God needs to know you believe in his promises. And while you're praying, if you remind him what he promised you, that's not going to offend him. As a matter of fact, it's going to energize him. It's going to excite him. It's going to move him on your behalf to know that you thought enough to read his promises, believe his promises, and that you believe in him enough that he'll do it that you'd ask him. You know, most of the time we don't ask somebody to do something unless we can know what? That they can do it. Say amen. One thing's for sure, I will never ask Sean Horbett to sing a special at Timberlake Baptist Church because he can't do it. He can't carry a tune and a bucket with a lead nailed on top. You don't believe me? Sneak around sometime in that book while he's singing. You'll come back in here real quick. You'll come right back in here real quick so you can hear Diane some of these old wonderful people sing. So I don't ask him to sing, but I'll ask him to do other things that I know he's capable of doing. Listen, there's nothing you can't ask God to do that he's not capable of doing. Now, you say, Lord, he, Moses said, Lord, if you destroy them... You can't bless them. Moses said, Lord, you didn't save them from the hand of the enemy to destroy them later. You saved them to be your inheritance, to produce for you. There's got to be a great future for Israel if they'll repent. He said, Lord, they were slaves of men and you freed them. They are now slaves of themselves and Lord, you can do it again. I'm glad God can do some things again. Amen? I'm glad he can forgive us again and again and again. I'm glad he can use us again and again and again. I'm glad he can bless us again and again and again. You say, well, how do I get that again? What I preach this morning. <laughs> do all. Do all and he'll do everything. He'll move heaven and earth for you if you'll just trust him. So Moses is begging. He says, Lord, work a miracle for this nation. Surely, Lord, you can work a miracle for them in this situation. You're a mighty God. Listen, God gets excited when you believe in him. God gets excited when you believe in him. Let me ask you a serious question. When's the last time you believed in him enough to ask him for something big and then wait on him to do it? God specializes in miracles. And Moses knew that Israel's need was for forgiveness. Just They just didn't know it yet. You know, sometimes I preach. And I know y'all the Sunday night crowd. Reach around, pat yourself on the back. Just don't break your arm doing it. Y'all the good crowd. But you know, I pray every Sunday, Lord, get a hold of some of these Sunday morning Christians. 
and just help them realize how much you love them. Lord, just reach down and stir their hearts and draw them closer to you. Get them more excited about your work. Get them more excited about the ministry. Get them more excited about reaching people for Christ. You see, a lot of people just don't know. They don't know what they, they think all they're supposed to do is come to church, put the fingers in the ears till it's over, and then walk out. Are y'all so innocent? They think they just got to come sit, put the money in the offering plate, and I'm done for another week. They got no earthly idea what a relationship with God is. A relationship with God is, listen, you get, when you got married, you didn't stand before the preacher and say, I promise to love him and love her on Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturday. Rest on your time. You ever been to a wedding where they said that? If you did, you was at the wrong place. That's a bad wedding to be at. You, you promise each other, each other to death. Do you part? Do you really know what to death do you part really means? Every day, all the time, all the way. I don't understand these men and women come in my office and tell me, I got to have a boy's night out. I got to have a girl's day out. You didn't get married to have a boy's night out and a girl's night out. You got married to be with that person till death. Do you part? It ain't popular preaching, but it's the absolute T-R-U-T-H. It's the truth. You say, well, preacher, I done been married to him long enough. I don't want to be with him all the time. Tough tiddly when you made a decision a long time ago, you got to stick with. You better teach these young people back here. You don't get married to get in and get out. It's till death do you part. And, folks, I'm here to tell you, you didn't get saved just to go to love God one day a week and serve God one day a week. You ask him to save your soul not till death do you part, but forever and ever. Amen. And I'm here to tell you the most important truth that we need to know tonight is that we need to love him as much as he loves us. We need to trust him and put our faith in him. Now, I've got to move on here. Man still needs rescuing today. Christians still need rescuing from themselves today. The battle of the flesh is real. It's, it's running wild and rampant. And I want to show you real quickly four things about the word flesh. I want to show you what the word flesh is about men, what the word flesh is with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. First of all, men. First Peter chapter 4, verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the, what's that word? flesh to the lust of men but to the will of God. God didn't save you for you to say, okay, now I'm saved and I'm going to live the rest of my life and do what I want to. No, sir. He saved you to serve him. Not to bless your flesh, but to bless him and to find out what his will is for your life and then go after that will and serve him with all your heart, soul, and mind. Lust have got to be suppressed. And I've got news for you. The only way you can suppress lust is with the word of God and prayer and faith. That's the only way. All right, so men, our job is to keep our lust under control, our flesh under control, and submit it and surrender to the word of God. Number two, look at the Father. 1 John 2, 16. For all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You say, preacher, that doesn't flow. Why did God say the less of the flesh, the less of the eyes, and why did he say the less of something else? Because that's the result. One plus one equals two. The less of the eyes and the less of the flesh equal the pride of life. You see, when you see what you want and then you go after what you want, it controls you. We must learn that we cannot please our flesh, not the least little bit, because it will destroy you. We have to please the Lord. We've got to please God. And then it says, it is not of the Father. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. If you're going to be like the Father, you're going to be humble, faithful, loving, kind. He says, but it's of this world. This world doesn't have anything for me and you. This world is wicked. This world is sorrowful and sad. I, I get so tired of looking at the news, I could scream sometimes. Because you never hear anything good. It's always something negative. It's always something bad has happened. 
I mean, I, 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 this, this afternoon in the paper, I saw where two or three little children had been killed in certain circumstances. That's bad news, folks. Amen. That's horrible news. Little children. Someone told me before church, uh, how many people died? Nineteen? Nineteen people died in a fire in New York City. Mike was telling me uh, another bunch of people died in Philadelphia last week. It's bad things happening everywhere. Bad news all the time. The world ends in tragedy. But you know what? I've never met anybody that followed God that had ever ended in tragedy. I look back at North Friday. They're going to bury him Thursday. And I was reading, they put an article in the newspaper, I think it was this week in Lexington, called him the Prince of Preachers. I said, Amen. The newspaper finally got something right. Say, Amen. He was the Prince of Preachers. But let me tell you how much Noah Fry loved God. Noah Fry told the people 20 years ago when they talked to him in an interview, they said, When are you going to retire? He says, Preachers don't retire. They don't retire, they, they serve God till they die. Noah Fry had, had COVID last year, congestive heart failure, and a couple of other problems along the way. I think he'd been in the hospital four times in the last 12 months, 91 years old. But in the midst of all that, he and Polly were going to change around and they were going to start staying in motels so they wouldn't have to drive that big motor home everywhere. <laughs> Polly looked at him after one night in the motel. She says, you either get me another camper or I'm through. I ain't staying in these motels. And you know what Noah Fry did? He went out and bought another one. Say amen. Never got to use it. But let me tell you what his intent was. I, I had lunch with him two weeks before he died. Wendy was sitting right there. And Wendy will tell you, his intent was, Brother Walter, I'm going to Lynchburg next week and preach. I'm going back on the road in January and I'm going to go back to preaching in January, he had no intent of, of giving up. He was going to serve God with every breath that was in his body. Matter of fact, the reason he cornered me that day for lunch is he won two more cases of his books. He won two more cases of his books. What are you trying to say, preacher? He was not of this world. His eyes were on the Father. Say so, amen. And he was dedicated to serving God. The world passeth away and the flesh thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth. His body is done, but you and more fry is dancing all over heaven. He's shouting all over glory. He's doing fine today. Men, they, they, they go after the flesh. The Father has nothing to do with the flesh. What about the Son? Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Do not make provision. In other words, don't get so close to it it can bite you. But you know what we do as Christians? We try to see how close we can get to the flame without getting burnt. And I got news for you. You cannot. Don't. If you know what your sin is that does so easily beset you, and you know how easy you fall into it, don't go near it. Don't allow it in your life. Don't go close to it. Don't make provision to fall in the hole you know you're going to fall in. It's important. Now, I'm proud of myself in the right kind of way. I went home this afternoon. I got on the scales one week I've been on my diet, and I was in intercessory prayer. I didn't even eat breakfast this morning before I got on them scales. I scared, slammed to death because I had done a couple of things this week and I fell in the hole. Y'all don't fall in holes? You need to come to this altar because you're lying. You do. I didn't fall in the bad hole, but a little, but I fell just the same. And I scared to death to get on those scales. I had been put on the holidays. I hate to admit this, but I'm at the altar, so I might as well go ahead and do it. I had put on 20 pounds in three weeks. And I knew them 20 pounds had to come off before I go back and see the doctor. Some of y'all need to go to the doctor so you'll understand what I'm talking about. So I got on them scales. I made sure Wendy and Brandon, I made sure even Charm went around. I hit that button and I stepped up on them scales. 
And I've learned one thing about them scales. If it takes them a long time to go deep, Walter's in bad shape. I'm in intercessory prayer, holding on to my desk, holding on to the walls, and hurry up, beep quick. But it took its time. When that thing got done, old Walter was shouting, no. In one week's time, I lost 14 pounds. I said, thank you, Lord. And then the devil says, now you can have spaghetti for supper. <laughs> Don't make provision for the, I still got five more to go, honey. And that first is easy. It's the second end that's hard to get off if you ever lost weight, you know what I'm talking about. You want to win, you don't make provision for the flesh. Why? Because the Son, listen to me, the Son, look, look at verse Romans 13, verse 14. The Son, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. In other words, look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Look to him. He'll help you. And if you don't need help, you're delusional. There's not a person in this room who don't need God's help tonight. Not a one of us. We all need God's help. But men, men have the problem of the flesh. The Father is not of this world. The Son has, has set an example for you to follow. Now what about the Holy Ghost? Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, look, 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 walk in the Spirit. Didn't say flesh. Do you know how hard that is to walk in the Spirit? It is H-A-R-D to walk being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We said, preacher, how do you walk in the spirit so you don't fall in the holes that of this world the flesh has created? By surrendering to the Holy Ghost. Well, preacher, how in the world do you surrender to the Holy Ghost? I told you this morning. <laughs> do all. Do all. That's how you surrender to the Holy Ghost. I know this morning's message was not one of them shouting messages. I, I knew that when I got into it. But you know what? It's one of those necessary messages. Because if you don't do all, you're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. You have to submit and surrender to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You've got to surrender, submit, and serve. And you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I promise you, you submit and surrender and you commence to serve and you ain't got time to get in the flesh. You got too much to do for God. You do too many miracles taking place, too many good things happening, too many blessings flowing. You don't want to quit. You get caught up in serving God and God's blessings and God helps you to surrender to him. He helps you serve him. All of men's lives, they're going to need forgiveness in the battle of this life. Forgiveness is a necessity and if you do not have forgiveness, you catch this? If you do not have forgiveness, the lust of the flesh will control you and eventually it'll destroy you. You cannot allow your flesh to control you. And you say, well, that's a young person's problem. Who lied to you? Who fooled you? You won't battle it from the day you're born to the day you die. Hey, it's, it's a problem that we all face. God's struggle is the request for forgiveness. Now look at B. Remember the faithful. Deuteronomy 9, 27. Moses said, remember thy servants, three of them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses reminded the Lord, though there were a lot of unfaithful Jews around, unfaithful men and women at the present moment of Moses' life, he said, listen, I want to remind you, Lord, that the fathers of the faith, those in the past were faithful servants looking for the promise. And they made mistakes too, and you had to forgive them. And they repented and turned around and look what they did for you. Now Moses wasn't reminding God of anything God didn't already know. But Moses was telling God, my hope is built on your forgiveness. My hope is built on your love. My hope is built on you being able to work with your children. 
real quick and we'll cut it off and we'll come back and finish it in two weeks. What about Abraham? He was faithful in sacrifice. Willing to give all to obey the voice of God. Now if you've ever had a child, you know how impossible it would be to lay that child on an altar and sacrifice him like an animal. But Abraham was willing to do whatever God said to do because he, if he did it, God would raise him up and bring him back because God had made him a promise. He was willing to sacrifice his own son to obey God. Let me ask you something. When the preacher's preaching, the Sunday school teacher's teaching, and God's speaking to you about something you need to give up in your life, did you give it up? That's a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. God tugged at your heart and said, you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing the other. God tugged at your heart. Did you surrender to him and ask his forgiveness? You see, Abraham was willing to give his only son if that's what God asked him to do. God's going to ask us all to give up some sin. We need to do that. Then, what if God asked you to change your plans for him? Easy preaching. Hard living. What if you've got your mind set on what you want to do in your life and you've got something you're looking for and God spoke to your heart and said, change your plans. Change your plans. This don't mean anything to you, but it means the world to me. I used to love to take pictures with a camera. You can ask my wife. I got one whole cabinet in my house. Ain't nothing but pictures. Pictures, pictures. I used to love to take pictures. I bought me a Pentax camera. That was way for some of y'all's kind. All y'all know is these phone cameras now. Now, I spent $500 on a Pentax camera. I had took journalism in high school, and they taught me how to use the camera and take pictures and all this kind of stuff. So I loved taking pictures. One night, a missionary came to our church. And he said, I want you all to pray about something. I need a camera to take pictures when I go to the mission field so I can come back and show slides. Y'all don't even know what slides are. That's for your time. <laughs> Got to come back and show slides of, of what we're doing so I can raise support and go to the mission field. God reached down to Temple Baptist Church on the fourth row on the left and tapped me on the shoulder and says, your camera's in your car. I acted like I didn't hear him like some of y'all did. Come on, shout. You know what I'm telling the truth. I ignored him and God reached his shoulder. He said, your camera is in your car. I said, Lord, I spent $500 on that camera. I love my camera. I enjoy my camera. You can't be asking me to give up my camera. God said, I'm asking. I done got in my car. I done got through the invitation holding my breath stubborn. Then got in my Dodge Valiant. How many of y'all remember what a Dodge Valiant is? That's a long time ago. I got in my Dodge Van, cranked that thing up, and the Lord said, I'm not going to bless you till you give him that camera. I put it in reverse, backed up. Heading up the hill to the stoplight. God said, I mean what I'm telling you, big boy. I turned the car around, drove back down to the building, parked where I had parked, got out the car, grabbed the camera, went in. I looked for Bill Gallinato. I said, Bill, here's your camera. I didn't stay around. I didn't stick around for a thank you because I would have probably took the camera and went back to the car. I, I, I loved that camera. But I knew he needed that camera worse than I did. He needed it worse than I did. I had to make a sacrifice. God asked me to make a sacrifice. If I'm lying, I'm dying. It wasn't six months later. Dr. Jerry Falwell come in, Wal in the Walmart, listen to me, come in McDonald's. I was working. There's a hard rule at McDonald's. You don't let nobody behind that counter. Nobody. If you do, I didn't, it didn't matter if you was an employee, a manager. I was a, I was a swing manager trying to get first assistant. Jerry Falwell come to the counter and said, Brother Walter, how he knew my name, I will never know in a million years. But they said once he knew your name, he never forgot it. He said, Brother Walter, I, got a pro I need to use it. This is before cell phones. Cell phones didn't even exist. 
He said, I need to use your phone. It's an emergency. I swallowed hard. This is a man's I'm going to get my diploma from. from. But I knew the guy I'd write my paycheck wasn't going to sign my paycheck if I let him behind that desk. And if I didn't let him behind that counter, I might not get a diploma. I was in a mess. Then Jerry said, I'm no keto person. I said, come on around and use phone with Dr. Falwell. Help yourself. I, I let him come back and he made his phone call. He come back and he had a hand. I ain't never seen such a hand on my man, a man in my life. He put his hand on my shoulder. He said, thank you, Brother Walter. I won't forget this. I thought to myself, I hope everybody forgets this. Because everybody in the store done seen Jerry Falwell come behind the counter and use the phone. I was in trouble. Went to the mailbox at school. Usually all you get in the mailbox at school is a bill or a report card. That's about it. But there was a note in my box. Dear Brother Walter, your bill has been paid. He paid the rest of my school bill for me. It was a whole lot more than a Pentax camera. God doesn't forget when you make sacrifices to him. Amen. Faithful sacrifices. Abraham was a picture of the Father in heaven who had let his son die. He was willing to let Isaac die. But God set a ram in the thicket. An angel will stop his hand. Number two, Isaac. Abraham was faithful in the sacrifice, but Isaac was a faithful son. You see, Isaac was the one laying there. And he wasn't no little baby or no little boy. He was almost a grown man. And he laid there, and he was willing to let his daddy do what he was going to do. Now, let me tell you something. I don't care if it's my daddy, my mama. If somebody comes at me with a knife, Walter's gone. And you will be too. Say amen or oh me. But not Isaac. Isaac trusted his daddy as much as his daddy trusted God. Willing to listen to his father and follow his father's leadership. Let me tell you something. God's going to ask you to do some things in this life you absolutely do not understand. But you know he's asked you to do it. And you've got to be willing to listen to him. Not only did he lay there and let his father prepare him as a sacrifice, he listened to his father all his life. And God made sure that Abraham got his blessing in the end and so did Isaac. This was a picture of how Jesus would love his Father in heaven and be willing to fulfill his perfect will through the life of his Son to redeem man. How many times did Jesus say, Thy will be none, not done, not my will, Father, but thy will be done. Isaac was faithful in sacrifice. I mean, Abraham was faithful in sacrifice. Isaac was fa a faithful son. We need to be faithful sons and daughters. Number three, Jacob faithful in struggle. There's not a one of us in this room tonight not struggling with something. Every last one of us are, if we're honest. But Isaac was willing to wait on God no matter the struggle to get God's touch of blessing and anointing. Jacob wrestled God. And he told God, he said, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. I'm not going to let go until you touch me. That's a picture of the struggle that man would have to allow the Holy Spirit to control and anoint their lives to carry on the message of the soul-saving gospel of Christ. When are you and I going to come to the point when we say, God, I'm not going to get up off this altar. I'm not going to get up off my knees. I'm not going to get out of the book. I'm not going to stop praying until you bless me and show me what your will is and what you have me to do. If we steadfast, stand fast and fight and stay close to God in obedience and faith, we will have the anointing power of the Holy Ghost of God on us. And I want to tell you something. I've had the Holy Ghost on me, and I've walked without the Holy Ghost. You don't want to walk without the Holy Ghost. You don't want to walk without the hand of God on you. It's a waste of your time, talent, and treasure to walk without God. But it's an investment in eternity when his hand's upon you. Just as God honored the faithfulness of Abraham, the faithfulness of Isaac, and Jacob, He'll honor faithful Israel and a faithful church. I close with this, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget 
your work and labor of love. Did Abraham make mistakes? Look at all the Arabs in the world. Yeah, he made a mistake. Did Isaac make mistakes? Yes, he did. Did Jacob make mistakes? He was known as a trickster. Yeah, he made many mistakes. But the same God that forgave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will forgive me and you. The same God that blessed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wants to bless me and you. You believe that tonight? I certainly do. It says, have served toward his name and that you have ministered to the who? So saints, it doesn't say self. Bless the saints and do minister faithfully. And we desire that every one of you do so the same what? Diligence. Tonight we ought to make our mind up. We want to be forgiven and we want to follow God. And if we want God's faithfulness to us. And it'll come. You just got to do what? i will make me proud. You got to do what? All. You got to do all. Hey, to the full assurance of hope until the what? Every one of us thinks about quitting. Things get tough from time to time. Things get rough from time to time. But God is never going to leave you nor forsake you. And if God has set it in your heart to obey his will, you keep on until the very end. Say amen or obey. Stay faithful. Verse 12. That you be not slothful. That's a hundred dollar word for lazy. But followers of them who through faith, followers of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, Joseph, David, Jesus, amen? Follow them as they follow Christ, who through faith and patience inherit, didn't say inherited. Do you notice that? It does not say inherited. It says inherit. It's still going on now. The same God that blessed Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Joshua, David, Jesus is the same God who wants to make sure you inherit the promises of God and the answers of God. Let me tell you something. I hope you don't ever have to go through what I went through wondering if you're going to live or die. Wait nine months to find out if you're going to have surgery and what's wrong with you. But I want to tell you something. I worried a whole lot for nothing. But don't look at me saying, you're the word too. Say amen or me. You're the word too. But I can honestly say there were times I thought I'd just give up and quit. But I didn't. And I'm glad I didn't. It was worth it all to see that Indian doctor walk through the door with his assistant and look at me and say, how does it feel to have a direct line to God? I thought, I wonder what he's talking to Wendy about. He ain't talking to Wendy. He's talking to me. He said, no just tumor. Fibro. Go home, live life. I said, bye. And I was out the door and went. God kept his promise. He honored his word. Those who don't quit win in the end. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. Father, I preach tonight as best I know how. Father, I pray now that your people will see their need not to be like man, but to be like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But they will look to Abraham, a faithful man in sacrifice. Isaac, a faithful son. Jacob, a faithful man in struggle. Lord, we all need to make sacrifices. We all need to be faithful. We all need to be a faithful son or daughter. And we all need to be faithful in the struggle. Because, Lord, we're all struggling in this thing together. There's no big eyes and little you. We're all in the same battle. We're all in the same boat. We all need you. And we need your promises to believe on them and to lean upon them, to live by them, to love you so we can live a life blessed by the hand of God that we might inherit 
the promises. In Jesus' name. Stand your feet, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. As they start this little verse of invitation, whatever your need is tonight, come. Come. Right now. Sheltered in the arms of God. You can be if you're trusting. Come on. Right now. Gather around this altar. Let's talk to God. I feel the touch.
will keep, which will keep her heart and mind through Christ Jesus. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Bless our sister and her family now. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you for being here. Thank you.